Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wednesday Build. This is episode 1.15, and today we'll be discussing the topic failure, feedback, and perfectionism, the dilemma of the new lawyer developer mindset. Today we'll be featuring new professions in legal tech and how to adjust your approach. So as you know, my name is Brittany Hernandez and you can call me the B emoji or B or peanut or brittle as my dad and my uncle like to call me. I'm from San Diego, California, but I'm based in London now. I previously served on active duty in the United States Coast Guard for four years as a bosun's mate, second class petty officer in Puerto Rico and Alaska, but I earned my GI Bill in order to go to law school, so this will come very full circle in this conversation around my time as a lawyer, as well as my transition into uh, going into more of the legal tech space after I got a master's degree with distinction from the University of Exeter and the London Film School in international film business, during which time I designed the, um, I invented the, the design and business model for an application called POCO, which would serve as a pocket council, which would allow uh, film students and early career filmmakers to get access to legal services fast and free while still paying lawyers at a competitive rate. And it was during this time that I was in my dissertation that I understood the power of innovations in legal technology to really solve human problems and increase access to legal um, services. So with that, I met the um, co-founder of Vala. She was the academic supervisor on my dissertation. So I was able to actually work for her after I graduated and became their business development and partner engagement executive, which will also feed into this conversation because I got a very, a very up close and personal look at the agile methodology, methodology into things like sprints and scrums and sort of building things in a lean style and all of the different things that you can imagine, what it looks like to collaborate with developers as someone with a legal background coming in in a business role. So all of these different mixes of things will come together in this conversation as we talk about things like failure, feedback, perfectionism, how I actually wrote a post about um, some anxiety that I had and panic attacks I was having during the time that I was going through this transition process because of my background as um, a legal professional. Um, so I went on to continue this sort of route in legal technology and focused on a platform called Gavel, formerly called Document, and I served as a Gavel expert uh, with Gigla, where I focused on creating no-code, low-code solutions for other lawyers to be able to utilize both internal and external workflows or applications in order to better serve their clients and have a different type of um, sort of client-attorney relationship that was facilitated by technology. So after that, I became really good at using the platform and was doing a lot of different things with Gavel, including the Lightning Talks for Legal Innovators series, which happens at the end of every month on that Thursday, the last Thursday, and uh, got a little bit of attention from Gavel, which um, made it to where they invited me to become the global ambassador to law schools. Um, and I love my role there. I get to be the program director and senior instructor for the Law Students and Legal Tech Access to Justice Fellowship that they've sponsored and run. Um, and also to speak at different schools and conduct workshops. So I'm very much now in this sort of mixed lawyer developer sort of role that I think is cropping up more and more in the legal profession as we see more lawyers understand the power of no code tools and no code software and the ability to take your own expertise and productize that into an application. So I also founded the Cormium Academy, which has Gavel certification courses, and I've created many of the courses myself, along with my business partner, Megan Sautel, who has created some of the course content as well. Um, and then I'm also, as I mentioned, the creator and host of the Lightning Talks for Legal Innovators series in partnership with Gavel, as well as this show, The Wednesday Build. I'm the creator of the free interactive digital magazine, Code Word Hex, which was actually built on Gavel, which we'll talk a little bit about as well. And uh, the creator and editor of the Tuesday Forecast, which is a newsletter that lets you know about all of the different upcoming events um, in the community. 
Lastly, I'm the founder of Kermayam Retreats, which is a way for me to connect with other entrepreneurs and high achieving, mostly female entrepreneurs, where once a month, or sorry, once a year in December, we get together in beautiful places around the world. And we just talk about our next year, we plan it out together, and then we get to go exploring, which is always really fun. So let's go into our conversation for today. And we're really going to just hone in on this idea of failure, feedback, and perfectionism, the dilemma of the new lawyer developer mindset, and the sort of juxtaposition of these two things. And it'll be a little bit humorous because I'm going to show you a couple of examples that illustrate the difference between these two completely opposite um, in some ways mindsets, but and training, I think, and expectations, as well as how we can take the parts that are similar and uh, sort of assimilate into this new mindset that we have to create as new professionals in this legal tech space that are a hybrid of a lawyer and a developer and how we can adjust our approach to this particular topic. So I thought in the interest and in the sort of theme of creative solutions to problems, I thought it might be fun to ask Chad GPT, what are the differences between these mindsets or just what's the different what's the mindset of a lawyer and what's the mindset of the developer and then we can kind of go through these a little bit and i'm also going to show you some fun um, videos and pictures to illustrate the differences from a societal um, perspective perspective as well as a reality uh, between these two different entities or <laughs> or groups so the first question i asked chat gpt is what are the key mindsets necessary to be successful as a practicing attorney just curious to see what came up and where there was any crossover so what it produced is there are several key mindsets that are essential for success as a practicing attorney the first is attention to detail which we'll go into as well as an attorney you need to be able to pay close attention to even the smallest details in legal documents contracts and other legal materials problem solving skills. Legal practice involves constant problem solving, whether it's resolving disputes, negotiating settlements, or strategizing legal arguments. Okay, so, so far, I'd say that these are similar to a developer mindset. You're always having to pay attention to detail. You're always solving problems. We'll go into that in a little bit as well. Strong work ethic. The legal profession is demanding and requires long hours, hard work, and dedication. Successful attorneys must be willing to put in the time and effort necessary to achieve their goals. That's fine too. I think that also comes up in the developer mindset. Effective communication. Good lawyers are able to communicate clearly and persuasively, both in writing and orally. Granted. Um, creative thinking. Sometimes the most successful legal strategies require innovative thinking and creative solutions, which will also come up in the developer mindset. Emotional intelligence. Being able to understand and manage your own emotions as well as those of others is an important skill for attorneys who work in high pressure, emotionally charged environments. Perseverance. Legal cases can take a long time to resolve and attorneys need to be able to remain focused and committed throughout the process. And then lastly, we have integrity. Lawyers are held to high ethical standards and maintaining integrity is crucial to building trust with clients and colleagues. This one's actually a really important point and the key difference I think is around consequences of failure. Um, one being that you can have your license revoked. <laughs> um, so it's not just getting fired, but having your personal um, as you know, your 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 personal reputation as a lawyer being destroyed, as well as your ability to practice law and feed your family with your um, legal expertise is in jeopardy. Whereas maybe as a developer, you still would have maybe a loss of reputation, but perhaps you would just get fired, but not necessarily have your whole entire life basically ruined by this um, because of maybe a small mistake. Well, obviously, if you get disbarred, it's probably not small, but the consequence being that your sort of means of making a livelihood as a lawyer would be in jeopardy. Overall, the legal profession requires a combination of analytical, creative, and interpersonal skills, as well as strong work ethic and a commitment to integrity. Okay, so now we have kind of an understanding of what Chad GPT thinks about the different key mindsets that are essential for success as a practicing attorney. Let's talk a little bit now and see the, the similarities and differences between this idea of being successful as an app developer. So I asked Chad GPT, what are the key mindsets necessary to be successful as an app developer? 
So it says, to be successful as an app developer, there are several key mindsets that are essential. Curiosity and a thirst for learning. The first thing being curiosity makes me so happy because I absolutely 100% agree that one of the most important aspects of what I do in coming up with different ideas for different applications, uh, whether they're legal or non-legal, is curiosity and a thirst for learning and to constantly be absorbing information in order to see how I might solve problems in a really interesting, efficient, or creative way. So it goes on to say app development is a constantly evolving field and successful developers are always thinking out new knowledge and skills to stay ahead of the curve. So it's a very much a forward thinking rather than a um, backwards, not backwards thinking, but you're thinking towards looking towards the past for answers rather in a developer mindset, you're really looking to the future and seeing how advancements in technology or how you can produce advancements and 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 facilitate advancements in technology in order to stay ahead of the game in this particular field. Um, so that's I think one of the key differences. I don't think that it's a key difference that you know you're not thirsty for knowledge as a lawyer. I think it's a key difference in the in where you're looking for um your sort of ability to do well in your field i think obviously as a lawyer you're constantly looking forward as well but a lot of this uh a lot of your arguments will come based on precedence which happens in the past we're saying that this case is like that case that happened where the judge um ruled this way or the law that has been established for this many years is applicable in this case where my client did this because the facts are similar. So you're looking backwards and saying, in the past, this happened like this, and it was it was argued this way. I'm arguing it this way, or you're distinguishing your case from something that happened already in the past to somebody else, because you're just trying to say, you're trying to analogize what is going on between your client's matter and someone else's matter. So I think in that way, you're looking to the past for information about how you should um, defend or, you know, um, represent your particular client. In, by contrast, in the developer mindset, you're constantly looking towards the future, um, what, and you're sort of filling in gaps. So instead of looking to the past and saying, what technology was being used in the 19 90s to solve this problem. You're saying what's being developed right now or will be developed in the future that I might be able to utilize in my application in order to, to continue to have new users come to the platform or to engage and better attract, um, engage and delight the customers that I currently have, as well as gain new ones. So I think that that is one key difference um, between the two is where where we're looking for um, our foundation of what we're doing at our core. So with that difference, we have a mindset shift that needs to happen, which is a lawyer who wants to create applications and act a little bit like a developer in that situation is you have to have a different way of looking at advancements and innovation as well as precedent. So, um, so I think this is, brings up a really good point here about this difference um, between where we look. So the other one is a, a one that's similar, attention to detail, which came up as also, so number one in a lawyer, but number two here in, um, um, in the developer mindset. So here it says that the success of an app often, often depends on even the smallest details. So a keen attention to detail is crucial for developers. So I think I do think this is true. And it's something that I think is one of the harder things about being in the more tech development space when you come from I think sort of in either case, I think it goes around the consequences piece that I was saying. So I think if we talk about this for a second, the attention to detail piece as an attorney is it, the consequence of not noticing a detail in discovery, for example, 
um, or in a case that is similar to yours could end up with you being in a lawsuit where your client is suing you for professional negligence. <laughs> Whereas in the case of being a developer, if you don't find the bug, maybe you are able to, it just doesn't work. And maybe you get fired or maybe you, um, or you just ask your colleague to help you or you utilize something that helps you find the bug or whatever else. Um, but your attention to detail, the consequence of having a lack of attention to detail, for example, is vastly different from that of a lawyer. And I think what that does, especially in the legal field, is it creates clinical perfectionists. <laughs> and I, I found this to be the case in myself, which was that when you are in law school, for example, we have the, you know, this kind of Socratic method where you're asked questions about cases in front of the entire class. And there's a kind of a dialogue between a single person sort of and the professor who is asking, okay, well, in the dissenting opinion of this particular case, how does that, you know, differ from the majority opinion? And why did they think that this was, um, you know, not the right decision? Or what were the three main reasons, blah, 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 whatever else. Um, and so you are put on the spot in front of, you know, 200 people in your class or whatever it is to be able to recall um, uh, very specific details of a case and your answers, how you formulate your answers, how you present yourself, how you project, all of these things of your appearance, your projection, your um sort of all of these different pieces put together kind of make up your ability to persuade the judge or your professor in this case that you know what you're talking about and that you're going to be able to defend this hypothetical client in law school, for example. And if you take that one step further, if you're standing in front of a judge and you have your client who could go to jail if you don't get everything right, I think that that really heightens this idea that you as a person need to present yourself as someone who is someone who never makes a mistake, who is very considerate and thoughtful about their appearance and how it affects the view of everyone, the judge and the jury and, and even your client on the success of the case. So when the consequences of your mistake um, or your lack of attention to detail is that your client is the person that you're representing is now in a position where they can lose their livelihood, they can lose their freedom. The consequence is very high. The uh, and and if we if we contrast that with a developer, the application won't work, which could still have the effect of you know affecting a user's ability to utilize the app. It depends on obviously what it is. So, um, you know, if we're talking about an application that serves as the infrastructure for this person's entire company, then that is a very, very strong consequence. But you probably wouldn't be identified as the person who made that mistake from the end user. So when I say that, I mean your client and your partners in the case or your, you know, all of the different people in your um, team, but also not only the, your internal team and not only your client, but also the judge and the jury and everyone who's sitting in the courtroom and the newspapers and everyone will be pointing as a lawyer to you for you personally, as a human, you, me, Brittany Hernandez, for example, I am the one who will be uh, sort of seen as the person who made that mistake and maybe get sued by my client for professional negligence or maybe um, reprimanded by the um, the bar association and disbarred for like all these different consequences are very, very high for someone who is in the legal profession as a practicing attorney representing a client. Whereas, as I mentioned, if you fail to identify the, the tiny, like the, let's say, for example, in Gavel, 
if you have um, if you change an uppercase letter and a variable to a lowercase letter and a variable that could break many different things in your workflow and break everything. But if you are, um, but if you are not, you're kind of like behind the screen in a way um, from your end users. And let's say if you're on a development team that is, let's say on Facebook or whatever, the individual person who is coding that thing is not going to be the person who is ultimately, you know, crucified for that particular mistake um, in the public's eye. So I think that that's really a key difference here around attention to detail is that Yes, maybe you would get fired or people would think that you're not very good at your job or whatever else, or it's just a mistake that a lot of people like do and it can be fixed or whatever else. But long story short is you won't personally be um, in a position where you could you lose your your livelihood over a lack of attention to detail um, and you won't it won't be so publicly known that it was you that made the mistake but if we see that from the lawyer's perspective you are the one standing alone <laughs> in the courtroom or you know in front of everyone saying something that maybe was a mistake or that uh, or opposing counsel points out your mistake in front of everybody so the visibility i think that's a better way of saying it the visibility of your mistake is is much higher and uh, much clearly, much more clearly your mistake than if you're on a development team where there are many people on the team who are, you know, you know, trying to work on this thing. And, you know, nobody knows that you are the person who wrote that particular line of code outside of the development team, for example. So I think we've kind of covered this one. Um, in detail. <laughs> so if we go on to the next one, which is problem solving skills, which I think also was a parallel here, which is the second one here, problem solving skills. Um, it says app developers must be able to identify and solve problems quickly and efficiently, whether it's fixing bugs, improving performance, or enhancing user experience. So I think this one's pretty similar, and um, there's not really much difference in this and it's just what types of problems you're solving are different. Um, but otherwise, I think this is pretty similar. Strong work ethic is also a parallel here. We have a uh, strong work ethic as number three. Here is number four. Developing a successful application can take a lot of time and effort. So a strong work ethic is important for staying motivated on on track. However, I would say, obviously, strong at work ethic is is correct in both situations. I just want to say that, point out that what it looks like on the outside can be different between these two professions. So what strong work ethic might look like for um, a lawyer might be that they, you know, bill 12 hours a day, 16 hours a day. Um, and it's all maybe like around these hours, whereas maybe, um, that could be similar in the developer mindset, but maybe that's writing a certain line of code or a, a certain number of lines of code in a day, or this could be um, um, also sort of, yeah, creating a, an app overnight or things like that. But I think something that wouldn't you wouldn't really see in a law office that I know of, except maybe some now I think are starting to be more like this. But um, so for example, I worked uh, as a law clerk for Wilkinson Mazio, which uh, is now um, they've split off and Sam has um, better APC. So anyway, that's just to say when we were at Sam Mazio, uh, Wilkinson Mazio, we would all do like game days or escape rooms and things like that. And they had a really cool office and we would do go to like WeWork and stuff like that. But so I say, I would say like, aside from that, the, when you picture a law office, you don't really picture the same sort of office as you would see a, a development team in. So let's just look up, for example, if we looked up, on Pexels, which is a stock photo uh, stock photo website. And let's just put like law office and see what comes up. Just from the from the internet's opinion of 
what an office for a lawyer would look like um, or the feel and the colors of it. We have a high rise building. We have someone with a fancy ring and writing on maybe a contract. We have a justice symbol with people with suits, lots of whites and sort of beiges, things like that. People looking very serious and very well dressed, perhaps arguing or having some discussion. People are in distress. People are discussing things. People are angry. Okay. <laughs> So not the best sort of projection, but we kind of get the idea. We have some very like, you know, mahogany sort of this chair seems to have an appearance in lots of different ones. I've, you know, also seen this in movies where this is the chair of a lawyer for some reason. So this idea and feel of the office is one way of looking at it. Now let's use the same website and let's look up something like, um, let's say like um so like maybe like a uh coding team coding office i don't know let's see software development let's just look up software development and then we have maybe like office let me just see i want to kind of focus on like the building okay perfect this was not planned. So we have people with um, sort of more casual clothing. We have people, more women, maybe um, colors. We have more colors. He's in a beanie and a t-shirt and has a cool watch on. We have some people with tattoos. We have, um, we have people with different types of computers, maybe more modern looking computers rather than paper. Obviously that's interesting as well. Lots of lines of code. We have kind of people more casually dressed. We have jeans, for example. So this is just to, we have someone having a lovely cup of coffee or tea. <laughs> I just think this is perfect. Uh, the elevators are more cool and um interesting colors people are in like this kind of modern building something that you might see in like new york or whatever else so anyway long story short is you can see the difference between the sort of the vibe or, or the feel of these two places and part of the reason why i bring this up around work ethic is that you can be working hard in a, an environment that's comfortable <laughs> um but because of the per, because of that idea that we are representing that we are personally uh, representing not only the firm, but also our client that we personally need to appear to be professional. We need to appear to be someone who is in command and in control of our subject matter, as well as our own personal selves. So I think that that's a huge difference. And that's not to say that people who are developers are not that way. Um, I'm saying that the the image that we're projecting with our offices and with our clothing and our manner, whether we're serious or smiling and all of these different factors come into play in this difference between lawyers and developers. But we're having to now meld these two things together in order to thrive in this shifting legal um, world where technology is becoming more and more dominant. One of the rules that I've mentioned in the past from this 12 rules to learn code from a Python bootcamp by Dr. Angela Yu, um, we talked about number nine, which is called play foosball. Um, let's see. And I'll just quickly cover this because we kind of went through it more last time, which is that um, in a company, people tend to complain that the programmers are always playing foosball or doing something else that doesn't look like work. People might not be able to tell, but they are in fact working. When you see them enjoying their foosball game, laughing and joking, they're probably suffering inside for there's a bug. There's always a bug or something mysterious about their code that they can't work out. Maybe the code is working perfectly, but unexpectedly, you know, things like that. So long story short is this idea that if you go walk into a uh, an office where people are developing an application there's maybe sometimes like bean bags a foosball table there's a coffee bar and um, there's snacks and colorful candies and it looks like you're i don't know in some 
kind of some simulated Disneyland for um, for workers. Or if you think about like the Google campus, for example, let me just see Google campus. Let's see, I've never actually looked at this, but I've just heard that they are amazing. And so Googleplex. Yeah, headquarters. Let's just see if they have some cool. It's so cool. Even the building shape is interesting. But notice it's not a high rise. It's sort of a very architecturally interesting building with lots of colors. Um, it's like a playground. Yeah, it's a bit like a playground. Uh, if you look here, for example, so we have this, yeah, it's like more playful, if that makes sense. But you wouldn't associate the word playful with a law office, for example. So I think that you're starting to see now some of the differences between these two approaches and mindsets and what is supported by the, um, the companies that want people to develop apps for them or with them. So let's go back to our chat GPT and see what else we have here. So uh, we talked a little bit about the strong work ethic and how that can look different. Maybe if you're if you're working hard and working late in a law office, maybe you know you're still dressed in your suit, you still have your shoes on, and you're you know going over some you know contracts or whatever else. And um, whereas if you're working hard in a, a you know app development space, maybe you're sitting on a beanbag and working on your computer and chatting with your colleague. And obviously, you know, this is all sort of like the point is that it's the impression that we're getting uh, that society is giving as as well as what the reality is um, kind of mixed together. So we're trying to meld these two worlds together right now in these new legal tech professions. We're trying to take people who are used to being judged based off of their appearance and their ability to um, project this confidence and this sort of trust, kind of saying, trust me, I know what I'm doing and I'm the one who will be able to take you from the beginning of this case all the way to the end and have it be an end in success for both of us uh, versus somebody who is focusing on developing something that's innovative and creative. And it, it's just in a different sort of headspace that we're, that is very different. So when, when we try to put them together, it can cause internal struggle <laughs> as I'll mention soon as well. Um, okay. So let's go on to the next one. Flexibility and adaptability. As technology evolves, app developers must be able to adapt to new trends, tools, and platforms in order to stay relevant. So I think this is really key as well because it's one that doesn't really show up on the lawyer side. And the ability to be flexible and adapt is something that I think is difficult if you look at how long it can take to change laws and how many different um how many different layers or levels of bureaucracy you have to go through in order to have a law changed. So in, by contrast, in the develop, app development and technology space, what we're seeing is this need and drive to scrap out with the old and with the new as much as possible. I mean, people even you know, dispose of their phones that they paid a thousand dollars for after one year, because now we have 10 different upgrades within and 10 different features in the new iPhone or Android phone or whatever else. So we see technology as very perishable, whereas the law is seen as very sturdy and uh, something that you that is sort of long lasting and we've had some of the same laws for hundreds of years and it comes dates back to you know you know old english days and so on so i think when we think about these two fields we have the old versus the new or the traditional versus the forward thinking and you're having two personalities having to be smushed into one person in this new legal tech space so if we go forward a little bit more to creative thinking, so I think this one 
did um, come up here as well, creative thinking here. So um, in the context of being a lawyer, it says most successful legal strategies require innovative thinking and creative solutions. And here for creative thinking, it talks about successful app developers are able to think outside of the box and come up with innovative ideas for new features and functionality. I do think that it's true that both require creative thinking. Um, and I would even go so far as to say that really successful both lawyers and developers have lateral thinking as a very strong um, feature, which is the ability to kind of, instead of thinking more linearly, we're thinking laterally in how maybe seemingly disparate things fit together. So maybe instead of a case that has almost exactly the same facts is what you're looking at, but instead, obviously that would be maybe the more efficient solution in that case. But let's say you are having a really hard time finding a case that matched your facts or was similar enough to analogize to which had an, an outcome that you wanted, the ability to think laterally would be useful in that case because you would be able to maybe reach into um, a different sort of case law that would um that would kind of still illustrate the point um and support you in a, a strong way and support your your client's case in a strong way um so that is kind of that creative thinking and that lateral thinking that we'd see in the law so i think that's very strong here and very useful and similarly in the development space uh, you're going to see uh, successful app developers are thinking outside of the box and coming up with these kind of innovative ideas for new features and functionality. I think one thing, though, is different here, which is, like I said, around the where we're pulling from. Um, so if somebody in the law is going to try to think creatively and out of the box, they're, they're still going to maybe have to pull from the kind of past in order to analogize to something from the past, whereas maybe for a creative thinking for the app developer, they're thinking um, about not only what was in the past, but also what hasn't come out yet and what might be there in the future. Um, so let's go on next to user centric focus, which is not in the um, mindsets that are essential for success as a practicing attorney list. And obviously this is just me kind of going off of chat GPT. So this isn't the necessarily the end all be all list of all of the things that would be useful. And, um, but I think so far so good and we're having fun anyway. But I think this is uh, one of the more interesting points to this conversation as well. And I think it illustrates a key difference between the two professions, which is, so when we talk about uh, a developer and we have this user-centric focus piece, it says the best apps are designed with the user in mind. So developers must be able to put themselves in the user's shoes and understand their needs and preferences. So this is something that I actually had a conversation with um, one of the co-founders of Vala about because I was having a hard time adjusting to being in that environment coming from <laughs> a legal background and part of that and also from being in the military to be fair because in the military I learned that I had to be very direct in order to make sure that everyone lived at the end of a mission because I was a coxswain so I had to drive the boat and command the crew and give them directions that were clear rather than being somebody who was like oh hey would you mind if in a moment when you have a second you could put the line on the bit whatever else and and for me it was very much ingrained that you had to be extremely direct, say what you needed, when you needed it, in order to make sure that everyone gets back alive. So that could also be part of what feeds into my particular style and what was hard for me. But I would say that coming from a legal background, you are expected to have the answers. I would be asked by people, after becoming a lawyer, I would be asked by people about the most random laws that had nothing to do with anything in my particular practice. And because I wouldn't know the answer to some random question, 
they would say, well, aren't you a lawyer? And so it's this idea that we are supposed to and expected as lawyers, as people who have just graduated, even, even law students are expected to know everything, that we are supposed to be able to pick some random rule from some random jurisdiction at any moment in time. And if we don't know the answer, we're personally seen as somebody who doesn't know what we're talking about. So we are conditioned then because of that to have this kind of idea that we're not allowed to not know the answer. So we also have it, this kind of dynamic where we have clients, whereas developers have users and that relationship looks very different between these two professions. So for example, as I mentioned, I am expected as a lawyer to be the one in the room that knows more than the client. I'm the one who's advising the client on their matter. Therefore, that means that I should know more about their case and about the laws that apply in their case than they do. However, when you're a developer and you have users, the user is actually the one that probably has the answers that you're looking for, because what you're trying to do as a, the, as a developer, as somebody who's developing an application to solve their problem, you want to know everything that they're doing at every stage so that you can figure out what their jobs are to be done and you can create solutions for those problems. So it's a completely different dynamic in the relationship between a lawyer and a client versus a developer and a user. And when you put those two dynamics together into one person and one relationship where you have the client who is also the user and you are the lawyer as well as the developer, that is a very complicated dynamic to have to sort of suss out because you are dealing not only with your own sort of um, sort of cultivated feelings of needing to be perfect from your legal background, but you're and you're you're sort of conditioning to have to be the person in the room who knows everything. You're also dealing with your client and the so-called end users perspective about you and their conditioning in society about what you're supposed to be like as the lawyer and that you're supposed to know everything. So I think that this dynamic of being a new legal professional or a professional in the new legal tech landscape is very complicated to navigate because you are trying to do something new in a profession and um, what's perceived as a profession that's very traditional. So I think this idea around the user-centric focus and the ability to have empathy for your client, I think obviously, or your end user, I think that's still relevant and, and important and utilized in the legal profession. But I think that this idea of how society expects you to behave as a lawyer is different than how they expect you to behave as a developer and how you're expected to appear um, is different in each case as well and how you're expected to communicate with your client and the power dynamic between the two especially around knowledge I think is one of the biggest differences that I had a hard time with understanding um, when I was moving more from the attorney client relationship traditional traditional relationship to more of a user developer client lawyer relationship. <laughs> so um, I think this one is really, really good. But what so what we're seeing more now is a shift towards legal design thinking. So that is this idea that you're taking design thinking, which is an idea around sort of app development, you could say, and putting that and applying that into the legal space, which is why we have this sort of dynamic here of the, the client user and the lawyer developer. So overall, it says a successful app developer must be a curious, detail-oriented problem solver with a strong work ethic, flexible and adaptable to new technology, creative and innovative, collaborative, and focused on the user experience. There was one rule that I also wanted to point out, which is it's okay not to know, which is rule number five from the 12 rules to learn to code everything we know from teaching 150,000 students by Dr. Angela Yu, which I mentioned when we looked at rule nine. Let's go to rule five, which is going to kind of support this point around 
this different type of relationship between the lawyer and the client and the developer and the user and having those all be the same people um, in each sort of relationship. So in the idea of somebody who is developing an application or coding something, for example, and you know now we're really moving a lot towards no code, but let's just talk about software engineers, for example are purportedly the profession that has the largest population of imposter, imposter syndrome sufferers. Imposter syndrome is a psychological phenomenon where people feel like frauds and massively underestimate their own skills and abilities. So there's this thing called a Dunning-Kruger effect. <laughs> and I think that this is interesting because of the, as we talked about the expectations of a lawyer and the expectations of a developer, um, and I think that they have the opposite problem in the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is there's this idea that you have how good you think you are versus how good you actually are. And then obviously here it's showing that imposter syndrome lives somewhere in the middle. Um, and when you're a developer and you have imposter syndrome, you're on the side of being better than you think you are you think you're not as good as you actually are. Whereas maybe on the lawyer side, and this is obviously no disrespect to lawyers because I am one too. And so I'm, I'm not trying to sort of say we're all, you know, egomaniacs or something, but we have to have an air about us that we know more than we probably actually do. So I, we have a completely opposite problem from each other. We probably think we're better or we need to appear that we think we're better than maybe that we actually are versus somebody who actually maybe knows more code than they think they do, but doesn't think that or, or act that way. So it goes on to say that programmers tend to be self-critical and constantly feel that everyone else is better at programming programming than they are. Um, and then, so there was a part here where it says, I saw a post on the Q&A site Quora where somebody asked, would I get fired at Google or another big tech firm if I was caught uh, using Stack Overflow as a reference? Which is funny because if you think about, let's say being a lawyer, for example, you know, would I get fired at my law firm if I referred to Google? for some answer to some question or maybe chat GPT or whatever else. And the idea here is that I think similarly in both cases, um, you know, you could get be afraid of checking references and asking for help um, because you feel it would affect your reputation in some way. But nobody can hold all the relevant information in their head. For example, this is the name of an iOS method. And then she gives this example of this long, complicated thing that would be like insane to have to try to remember. It's almost 400 character. In iOS program programming, there are over 800 classes, 9,000 methods, and growing. And in uh, web development, there's a new framework every week. No one will expect you to be able to remember the code. This is the precise reason we are programmers. We can get the computer to do the boring stuff for us. So that's the idea here. And if we, you know, if we kind of relate this to law, for example, I think we similarly feel probably inside some imposter syndrome, but we cannot project that because what we project affects our client's case. So I think that's kind of one of the biggest differences I see between the two. So we've done pretty well so far. I wanted to kind of go into a little bit of this a little bit more on this sort of outward appearance and then go into a little bit more of what we're actually seeing in uh, real life as more and more people are becoming this new lawyer developer hybrid. So I just thought it was fun to Google the most famous lawyers in the world and see what they look like and what comes up and then to do the same type of thing where we said the most famous app developers in the world and see what comes up. And I think what you'll see is very interesting. The first, if we look at the most famous lawyers in the world, so we have, first of all, lots of men, um, all are dressed in suits, all maybe older than 30 years old or so, and they're all, you know, looking quite serious, we could say. So that is the impression I want you to have when we think about the most famous lawyers in the wor world. You can also see that many of them are alone. So they're standing alone. So they are personally known. People probably know their names. If we go to the all, for example, 
example, you have uh, lawyers. Uh, we have Roy Black, John Branca, Bill Newcomb, Willie Gary, Robert Shapiro. And we have all these different names. This is gonna be important when I show you the next uh, result. So as you can see here, we have mostly men in suits looking quite serious. <laughs> People know their names and they're all some or most pictured individually here. Now, if we go over to the same prompt in Google, most famous app developers now though in the world, we actually see only one person on the screen so far. Now we have two, some, well, now we have more women. We have lots of colors, but we don't see a list of people's names. And I thought that this was really interesting because what we actually see is award-winning apps. Um, who are the biggest app developers? And they're company names. They're not individuals' names. I find this so interesting. And if we have, if we even go to the 10 best app developers or who is a famous app designer, we have names of companies and not names of individuals. This is one of the most important points I want to try to make. And I think it's so fascinating that this came up because I just looked at this and thought that is so interesting. Because if we look at the most famous lawyers in the world and we look at the most famous app developers in the world, there is such a massive difference. And you're trying to meld these two worlds together by having lawyers now become app developers with creating legal products from their expertise. And so the idea that we're melding these two worlds is really complex because we're asking people or we're inviting people, I would like to say, we're inviting people who are coming from a background like I did, where you are expected to have your own sort of aura about you that projects confidence, that projects sort of an assurance to your client that you're going to be able to take them from the beginning to the end of their case and end in a success, and that you're going to be able to represent your firm, yourself, and your client in a manner that would be appropriate within a courtroom environment that's very traditional. You're taking that person and you're dropping them into the app development space, which, as you can see, is not about the individual it's about the team and the solution and the end user, not about you. That's a completely different approach. And obviously in the law, we are there to serve. We're trying to serve our clients in the best way possible. And we work hard and we study long in order to be able to do that. What I'm saying is that what you can see from this visual image is this stark contrast between how we are expected to behave and the role of the team and the collaboration element of building in our um, sort of app development space versus you are as an individual standing up and representing your client in a courtroom, for example. And obviously not everyone practices litigation. Many people are transactional attorneys and maybe work more with companies um, with their sort of counsel or whatever else. So there's many different roles, but let's just say, for example, in the case of somebody who goes to court a lot, they are somebody who would be representing someone personally and maybe more well known because it's a little bit more of a visible profession where you're standing up as yourself in that room and people are seeing you speak, whereas somebody who is a developer is somebody who is more behind the scenes creating those lines of code or developing the application and not really seen by anyone as you can see here to have any type of recognition as the world's most famous app developer now obviously we do have people like mark zuckerberg who um, created facebook and he is obviously a very well-known developer in this space but if you even look at the difference between the most famous lawyers in the world and his pictures, he's wearing a t-shirt in all of these or a sweatshirt and he's of a younger age and he just is completely different from the projection that you have from the most famous lawyers in the world. Finally, in the last few minutes, I wanted to point out two fun videos that we'll go through and then a couple of examples of some awesome uh, upcoming, up and coming lawyer developers that I think are doing a great job. So the first is going to be this uh, trailer from Suits season one. 
So we'll go ahead and watch a little bit of this and I'll comment on how this is different from what I'll show you next, which is a Silicon Valley trailer. You are looking at the best closer this city has ever seen. Closer, huh? Baseball? Attorney, I close situations. What did you get me? I said I was gonna get you, 158. Pencils down. Excuse me, do I know you from somewhere? I don't think so. I told you I wanted a 175. You're a B minus student. I get you a 175, they'll know you cheated. I can have my money, please. Recruiting, Harvey. Your interviews are set up for tomorrow. Can we please skip the recruiting? We need people who think on their feet, not another Harvard clone with a rod up his ass. You went to Harvard Law. I'm an exception. Find me another one. Okay, so if we even just look at these first 20, 30 seconds of this clip, what we see is people in suits. The name of this show about lawyers is called Suits. So that's clue number one. <laughs> um, they're in high-rise building. They're in really, really nice clothing. We have um, you know, people talking about Harvard and we have people talking about, um, you know, find me someone as good as you. We talk about closers and negotiating situations and all these different things. So if we go forward a little bit, you can see sort of the. Um, and you haven't setting. even gone to any law school. What if I told you that I of the room is very fancy and both are in suits and very professional. We see, uh, we see- Go ahead, characters. you've hit on me. We can get it out of the way that I'm not interested. Yep. Paralegal, even this idea around having a conversation um, about um, you know, sexual harassment, I'm not interested in dating you. So office politics here and so on and so on. Really care about me. So get your skinny tie out of my face and get to work. It's very competitive and hard hitting. So obviously this is a show. It's not necessarily real life. However, the projection of what we expect lawyers or think lawyers are like, I think is still relevant. And so we're going to contrast that now with this Silicon Valley season one, episode five scrum scene, um, where this is a group of app developers who are, or just developers in Silicon Valley who are creating some type of application or a soft piece of software, and they're discussing scrum now there are in this two minute and 50 second clip there are several swear words and sort of references to um body parts that would might be inappropriate so i'm trying to cut around them but if i mistakenly don't pause it in time i apologize but we'll just we're getting the vibe of the difference between a lawyer's you know how we think of lawyers and what they are seen as being like versus what developers are seen as or what they're um sort of expected to act like first of all you're factory period they're in like a house a 70s type of house in silicon valley there's a tv there are couches so first off also this guy's in jeans and a t-shirt uh well we have a lot of work to get done so maybe we should do have a hoodie do that instead also younger dude relax okay we each dude never heard in a law firm i would imagine through a full module this morning we're just taking a little break drm is now a thing of beauty wait you did drm yeah i did drm why did you do drm this idea that there might be some duplication of work and the need for more structure. I said I would do DRM, you would do error handling. Anything to do with errors sounds like your whole vibe. Yeah, I handle errors. Scrum? Like every day you yes, scrum. You scrum. <laughs> so this guy is this guy coming in who's saying that they need to have more structure to the way that there are. <laughs> developing their application or software and um, wants to do this kind of scrum med methodology. So from rules-based filtering, we go to workflow, at which point that card is moved from the ice box into the in-progress column, and it stays there until it is ready for testing. Okay, this increases visibility into our team's progress. And that gentleman is Scrum. So I think that's a good place to stop here. But you can see the complete differences between suits even the name, as I mentioned, and Silicon Valley here, we have developers. So that's just a kind of a fun way to show this. I'm going over just a little bit in time, but I will just kind of wrap this up by saying that what we're seeing now is that we have a lot of lawyers turned lawyer developers where they are still practicing law, but they're also using their expertise to create legal products. And they're putting them on things like the Gavel Marketplace, for example, where we see discovery letters, employee new hire letters, 
model appearance releases, we see location releases, referral agreements, USM 94 forms, separation and divorce documents, and then you have people like Hello Divorce who are packaging these different DIY applications into different plans and services. So we see plans as low as $99 for a, a DIY divorce in your state. Oh, actually, this is $400. My apologies. So then you also could see that you have this ability to have a cooperative plan, a plus plan or a pro plan at different levels where there's more or less involvement of a lawyer. Then you also see, lastly, contract high in this example where you have a la carte documents that have been turned into applications, things like a confidentiality and non-disclosure agreement, amendment agreements, appearance releases, coaching agreements, consulting agreements, credit card authorizations, internship agreements, and so much more. So we're seeing more and more from this world that we are going into a phase of having a new lawyer developer mindset that needs to be cultivated. And we need to adjust our approach as legal professionals to conform to a more developer mindset while still retaining our um, sort of presence of mind and, and need to um, represent, our, represent our clients zealously. So um, if you have any questions about this, you can reach out to me at Brittany at Cormayam.pro. I'm going to skip the announcements for now and just say that if you'd like to join us for Core 1 Gold tomorrow, that's going to be the start of Gold Week. Or if you're interested in taking some gravel certification courses with me, you can reach out to me as well. I will be here next Wednesday. Actually, I'm going to be in Berlin, um, which will be very exciting for the first time. I get to meet some people from the team at Softer. Um, and the topic will be when the business comes before the plan, build the, build the model around it, which is going to be a really exciting topic. You can connect with me on LinkedIn or via email at Brittany at Carmam.pro. If you have any questions about Gavel's law school program, you can email me at Brittany at Gavel.io. So thank you so much for those of you that are with me live for being here. And I I will see you all next week. Bye, everyone.